But now to the matter at hand. We are, we are extremely fortunate to have three distinguished panelists on the program. Our curator, Ellen Wang, and two artists, Ming Ren and Aung San Zhang. Then let me briefly introduce them before handing the screen and the rest of our time over to the moderator. Ellen Huang was, until about a year ago, curator for Asian art at the Atlant. And it was during her exciting and productive time with us that she conceived the beautiful, provocative installation, Clouding. This exhibition extends a series of innovative exhibitions that she has put on during previous appointments at Stanford's Cantor Center for the Visual Arts and at the University of San Francisco. Ellen is a historian of art, technology, and material culture with a BA from Yale University and a PhD from the University of California, San Diego. Her research and teaching, university teaching, integrate the applied and natural sciences with the history of ideas and art. She's currently completing a scholarly monograph about the theme of critical making through an exploration of Jing Dezhen porcelain through the early modern and modern periods of world history. Ming Ren is an American Chinese artist whose mysterious ink world, part one, 2016, we created with Han Song Chang, is the focus of our discussion this afternoon. He holds degrees from both the China Institute of Art and the San Francisco Art Institute. After moving to the United States in 1988, he's exhibited widely in museums and galleries. His work is now in the collection of the San Francisco Asian Art Museum, the Shandong Art Museum, China Academy of Art Museum, the Kalushan Academy of Fine Arts Museum, the Taipei Fine Art Museum, and the San Bernardino County Museum. Our third guest, Dr. Han Song Zhang, has a very special qualification, which in our context must be mentioned first. He is, he is a Carolina alum, having received his PhD from the Department of Computer Science in 1998. He has built on that and on his master's degree from the China Academy of Sciences to establish an extraordinary career as a scientist, entrepreneur, and investor based, based in Silicon Valley. He was chief scientist at, at Niantic, maker of the blockbuster AR game Pokemon Go, where he led technology initiatives in augmented reality and artificial intelligence. He was the founding vice president of technology at, 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 at Roblox Corporation, the world's largest platform for user created games. Of his many other contributions to the field, I will just mention that his first startup, in the first startup, he created the architecture for a graphics engine that ended up powering Google Earth. But aside from science and technology, and important in this context, he is also deeply interested in art, philosophy, and meditation. He's a guest professor, China Academy of Art, and a PhD advisor at the Shanghai Academy of Fine Art. He has exhibited large-scale interactive art pieces at important top venues in China, at City Field in New York City, and we're delighted to say currently at the Ackland Art Museum. So with all this combined knowledge, insight, experience, and creativity in front of us, we are, are sure to witness a fascinating discussion about artistic collaboration, contemporary art, and the piece at hand in particular. So with our thanks from the Acton to our panelists, I'll hand things over to Ellen, our moderator, to get things rolling. Thank you, Peter, for your introduction and your um, collaboration with me on this show as co-organizer and all the colleagues at Ackland. Um, and also want to thank in particular the artists Han Song Zhang and Ming Ren for joining us today to talk about this special collaboration, its relationship to the exhibition on view for a year at the Ackland, and to share a little bit about their creative process and reflections about different media and interactions amongst them, particularly in today's um, technologically infused landscape. In their work, it is striking to think about the convergence of ink painting, an art form whose history, according to scholars, span from at least fourth century AD and um, bringing it together into conversation with real-time computational animation imaging. Given the virtual landscape in which much of our social existence takes place, 
I thought that this sort of form of sociality is particularly more pervasive this last year. And so this conversation, I hope, will give us all a chance to consider the porous boundaries between virtual reality, virtual and real, real art and life. Um, so let me share my screen to explain a little bit about how I saw the ways in which their uh, Hansong and Ming's um, collaboration fit in with the historical objects and paintings on view this next year at Aquin. So I will share this. This is a, uh oh, back up. <laughs> okay, this is the installation view. Uh, and I haven't, uh, and I thought that um, the museum and the team did a really, it was a, it's wonderful to see it over um, digital images. <laughs> and um, when I was researching the permanent collection, a theme that has been on my mind while looking through the the really high quality and expansive collection of Asian art at Ackland. Um, one of the themes that came to my mind frequently <coughs> in researching the history of art of China is the way in which the, the theory of the arts frequently made use of the concept of, or the trope maybe, or and I wouldn't say a trope, but perhaps the theme of clouds and um, the repeated emphasis on the way in which clouds animate and motivate um, imagery in painting genres, as well as various styles of calligraphy. Um, so for instance, I'm just showing everyone in the audience today a quick sort of draw from my research um, uh, you know, on when I like to think about art theory from other traditions other than 20th century US or something like that. And here you can see one citation that we think dates to about 200 BCE. And um, if you read it quickly, there's a mention of how when you use your brush, you ought to give it quick turns and you um, bring it down swiftly. So it discusses rhythm and speed. And then there's these metaphors about how your brush should move as ill. It was a fish. And then here at the very end, it, there's a sentence about it should be thematized or um, allegorized as a sort of cloud over great mountains. Um, and 500 years later, in fact, a one of the first pieces of writing about what calligraphy entails, so a, a theory about writing and calligraphy using brush and ink, and I must mention written by a, one of the most famous female calligraphers in Chinese art history, is um, likens the entire practice of writing to seven strokes. Later on, it became eight strokes. But around 300 AD, the, the female calligrapher wrote that the first stroke, which looks like this horizontal stroke right here in white, ought to be a cloud formation stretching for a thousand li. And the, the li is a sort of um, unit of distance, as you all probably know. So uh, it continues to make um, draw connections between landscape and animal tusks as forms of strokes and calligraphy. And so this show is kind of born out of the, the thinking about this prevalence of clouds in these theoretical texts and the different various visual manifestations of this in painting and in calligraphy and moreover in other media and art object productions and object design in the history of um, making and um, and archaeology from China, and more broadly, even to Central Asia and um, other parts of East Asia. So as you can see there here, you will have an opportunity if you visit the show to see various um, paintings that will be on rotation, I think. And then there are some devotional objects that would have been book covers for sacred texts in the arts of Buddhism. and. Um, you know, it's actually been interesting to me to think about how ceramics, the long tradition of the so-called celadon glazes that were so valued in the early 20th century in Europe became, um, were likened to clouds in, in poetry as well. In fact, there's a line, if I can switch to this, this view of this case of range of celadons, which um, writers often grapple with the ineffability of the color because they will say it's bluish, greenish, and gray. And by combining all these colors together, you can sort of feel the sense of difficulty in capturing what the color is. And so I think one poet around 900 AD 
wrote that a bowl, I think, and I often like to think it's the one on the right here on the very corner. Um, and if you go look at it in person, there's even clouds carved into the surface. Um, it has been metaphorically likened to a thin ice that holds green clouds. I have no idea what a green cloud is, but um, it just made, it was sort of a striking poetic referent for me to think about um, when bringing the objects of the Ackland together. Um, and another, maybe one quick slide is to show you the, I think this is the entry way, point to the show. You will see earlier ceramics and even um, bronze vessels, which were the highest and most treasured form of art made around 1000 and 1200 BCE um, of the Shang and Zhou dynasties. And there, if you look closely, you will find clouds imaged as side-lying S's and geometric um, curves and squared off sort of frets. And so I've always thought that that was interesting that those ornaments would become the ground, the background from which totemic mask-like figures should appear, um, sort of a figure ground um, relationship on such 3000 year old artifacts from um, 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 the Asian continent. And uh, so, I, I thought it was an interesting exploration to just introduce the various ways in which they are visualized, the clouds are visualized. And given the expanding realm of, I'll go back to um, the, 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 the show, a picture of the show, and you can see Han Song and Ming's um, painting in the background or their work in the background here. So when you go to the last portion, I think you can see the interactive work. And um, in my mind, given the expanding realm of cloud-based computing, um, as I kind of introduced at the beginning, I thought that I wanted to think more about how the, what these digital and computer-based mechanics that link all of us across vast distances and across time zones. Um, and when I thought about their collaboration in which there's a um, contemporary painting in ink on um, absorbent paper, which is the, uh, you know, the main media for ink painting over 1500 years. And Ming will later on talk a little bit about that. Um, then when a viewer goes and views it with in, um, in that space that's been created by Han Song as well, um, that viewers will generate in real time a sort of image um, projected onto the opposing wall in this case. Um, and I thought it was interesting to think about how painting has somehow always reached beyond ourselves. And in this collaboration, it um, continues this idea of this ever present ubiquitous cloud as a concept, um, particularly as it reaches into like the, the technological um, computational world, even if this work isn't particularly, you know, that directly linked to say cloudware. Um, it also makes me think about um, uh, maybe the ways in which artists have always referred to one another and worked in collaboration across time and space in China in particular and East Asia. And um, when a viewer to the museum visits this, they generate their own unique um, projection. And in that sense, um, it allows us to question the, in, the, the porous boundaries between sort of individual and artists and collective and collaboration and um, how we're really all part of a larger community here. Um, so with that, I just thought I would turn immediately to our artists who are with us to talk a little bit about their process, if that's okay. okay. Um, so this is the image I, I have of the, the installation right now. And I was wondering, Han Song, if you could talk a little bit about um, your, your, what you first saw in the painting um, as you were creating the, the more technology-based, modern technology-based aspect of the, the work, the collaboration, and to hear from your own words, kind of what you saw, what you thought, maybe how it's related to your training um, as a person who's creating virtual reality, personal handhelds. 
Well, uh, thank you, Alan. I was uh, struck by uh, your instruction and its uh, repeated mentioning of a natural phenomenon as in clouds, right? Um, guess who, who else would be interested in natural phenomena? Well, scientists, of course. Right, so uh, I, I guess uh, to set uh, uh, the general context of uh, what we're doing here, uh, it's important to note that, uh, you know, there is a uh, material aspect uh, to, uh, to art, right? So art, uh, the artists, uh, they use uh, natural elements or materials, right? And they manipulate the natural phenomena that's related to these materials uh, for uh, creative purposes, right? For example, in the case of, uh, um, of ink art, right? Uh, the materials slash elements are water, ink, paper. And uh, what the ink artists like Ming manipulate would be the flow uh, of the fluids, right? So that's the uh, natural elements and natural phenomena being manipulated for, um, for creative uh, purposes. And uh, now science, uh, has also um, been interested in this uh, from a different angle, which is, you know, uh, science has endeavored to find out like what's, what are the laws of nature or uh, what are the, the rules behind such natural phenomena, right? What, what is uh, uh, governing uh, such natural phenomena? Uh, that basically uh, summarizes uh, the, the essence of, uh, of science, right? So, after a few thousand years uh, of uh, such efforts, uh, I would say uh, most prominently in the last uh, um, few hundred years, right? Uh, we have a pretty good understanding of a very wide um, variety of, uh, of natural phenomena. And uh, that includes uh, clouds, actually. Uh, we understand the clouds pretty well uh, and uh, fluids, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this is to say that we understand the laws and rules uh, of nature that lie behind uh, such natural phenomena and, uh, and drive them, right? So the, uh, this understanding includes uh, fluids and uh, fluids uh, are one of the uh, most widespread natural phenomena and that's why it's uh, intensely uh, studied uh, in science too. Uh, so the laws of fluids were established in the in the 1800s, early 1800s, uh, in the form of an equation uh, named uh, the the Navier-Stokes uh, equation. Uh, they are named after uh, the mathematicians uh, who uh, formulated them, right? Uh, so that's a long time ago. So there's uh, there's nothing new there. But what happened was that only in the recent decades, uh, the computers. Uh, the computer technology became uh, powerful enough uh, to the ex uh, extent that we can put a uh, digital world or a digital material uh, inside the computer and apply the laws of nature uh, to that uh, digital world, right? So essentially, you uh, create a version of the real world inside the computer and apply the same laws of nature to that digital world, right? So, so now, like, why would you, why would you want to do that? Why would you want um, a, a digital version of the real world? Well, it turns out that uh, if you have a digital version of the real world, you can predict what happens in the real world um, by uh, mocking things up, by uh, doing experiments uh, in the digital world and in the, in the digital material, right? So that's uh, usually, uh, faster, that's uh, cost effective, that's, uh, oh, frequently a lot less uh, dangerous than doing things in the real world, right? So, um, I mean, the, the modern um, airplanes, rockets, uh, bridges, skyscrapers, boats, I mean, you name it, uh, they are built this way, which is to say that uh, they uh, went through the digital stage first, right? So um, the category uh, of engineering uh, activities uh, that, uh, you know, build things this way is in general called a simulation. So now uh, coming back to our topic, 
um, this experiment uh, me and I have, or th this exhibition, uh, is in the general uh, context of simulation. And in particular, uh, this is a simulation of, um, of fluid behavior, right? And uh, in the, the process is usually referred to as uh, computational fluid dynamics or CFD, uh, but um, the, the term is not important. Uh, you, uh, what uh, needs to be known is just, um, this is a simulation of a fluid behavior based on the laws of fluids that were actually discovered like 200, uh, 200 years ago. So uh, that would be uh, the general context uh, of uh, this work. Um, you know, when I first saw uh, Ming's uh, paintings uh, at a show, um, my first thought was, well, um, I probably have a way to make this move uh, gracefully because I'm familiar with, uh, you know, the simulation aspects, uh, you know, the, the general technology that's usually used uh, to, uh, to do aerodynamics for airplanes and, uh, you know, for Formula One cars or designing boats, right? But it does model a fluid uh, phenomenon. So I was uh, like, okay, uh, this can move rather gracefully. However, uh, the result after me and I got together and uh, did the experiment on this, the result uh, was uh, um, quite surprising in the sense that uh, uh, these motions go really well uh, with his painting. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's like uh, the simulation and his original paintings were made for each other. We did uh, experiments on uh, quite a few of his paintings, uh, some black and white and some color, uh, but uh, they all come alive uh, with this kind of motions, which probably speaks to the fact that uh, they were um, fluid and ink and water phenomena uh, to begin with. Back to you, Alan. That is really fascinating the way you connected the sort of first mathematical explorations and grappling with uh, you know something sort of liquid in the state of liquid and you know clouds being sort of this intermediary state at least according to you know in a sort of rough way of describing it I, uh, that's really actually i'd remember hearing that before but the way you yeah. put it to get to so really the um to the the uh, air and clouds is a uh -huh. compressible liquid water is not compressible but uh, they are liquids so this was very fascinating to hear. I mean, this is great. And especially to think about how these are all different media coming together um, and, and they're transformed when you're there looking at it. Um, I, I'm going to ask a question of, of Ming about your materials. Like in particular, this painting that's on the left, which if you don't mind everyone, I will, since I'm asking about the painting portion of the work, the mm. art, uh, I have to advance. Okay, so this is only part of it. It doesn't fit on my, I just wanted to show kind of what Han Song was referring to when he saw it as a, a sort of ma material manifestation of CFD, um, com computational fluid dynamic and how he then could also impart his role of making it move gracefully as, a, as his part of the, as the co-artist in this project. I mean, what is, can you talk a little bit about your use of materials here and your, I know there's something kind of unique about the way you approach ink painting and it's mounted on, um, you know, after you paint it, it's mounted on another surface. So could you talk a little bit about that? What is the reason for it? Yes. Uh, Maybe. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Alan. Yes. Um, well, actually, I believe everyone know the traditional Chinese art they mount on the silk scroll. See, uh, when you see the screen, you know. See, so you can. See, I am holding uh, one piece of uh, uh, the the traditional scroll, and uh, you know you probably get a very familiar with in the museum. And when it's open up, the scroll, then also the paintings. Okay, this is a very, very old, it is a, a Qing Dynasty work. They are mounted on the silk scroll. That, that's usually a museum and all those uh, uh, traditional presentation for Chinese art. 
uh, it's uh, good things is easy to carry because it's light, you know, so you can uh, carry by your hand and also moving somewhere else. And uh, uh, that's the easiest way. But the difficulty is when you show those, when those work because the paper made it, it's very hard to preserve, you know, because the weather and temperature and also all kind of room condition will be affected to the to the to the to the paper. So sometimes the paper getting time get wrinkled and get unpleasant to looking. So this is uh, very hard to keep as a fresh. So that's why the paperwork in a museum, especially I believe uh, you know, so uh, and other museum people know it's very hard to preserve uh, for history. So what I'm thinking about uh, how can you make the Chinese uh, painting on shrimp paper can be more strongly hold it on and uh, make sure it can be present nicely as well. So uh, I, 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 then I found out the Western canvas, you know, so which is uh, easy to hold the stronger paper. And, uh, and, uh, and then I tried many times, try to uh, mount the very fragile uh, shrimp paper, uh, we call the rice paper on canvas. You cannot use the regular groom. So regular groom wouldn't work and a canvas is soft. So all what I use, I use a quick medium. A quick medium with a transparency, a quick medium, very thin it down, very carefully to uh, place shrimp paper on the top of the canvas. It's very easy to be broken down. In the last minute, you can broken the whole thing. So it's a, it's a very risk of work. But finally, it turns out it's good because once the paper be uh, mounted on the uh, canvas. Let me show you the one very small piece. And also the paper is not just like the, the surface to be protected and also well protected by acrylic medium as well because acrylic from inside to go outside to make the whole picture completely and uh, we call the uh, uh, acrylic, acrylic sized. So whatever your finger touch it or even uh, a drop of water touch it, it wouldn't affect the picture at all. And also it's easy to hold the picture flat and also without a wrinkle at all. So, and, and I believe this will be easier for the museum to present to the museum to protect it and without the, all kind of a power burn. And uh, this is uh, what's the material. That's what I, um, you know, so if nobody else is doing like that. I was the, I think I'm the, you know, the first person to start with this, uh, the technique I, I invented for my, you know, the, the work, uh, because it's too risk, especially the larger piece of work, like the work I right now is showing at the Akron Art Museum. It's, uh, it's so big, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a 12 foot, you know, it's, a, it's no, it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, about the four meters long. So it's a very risk to do that. But the good things, you know, you don't have to worry about the weather, they will be getting affected by the weather, temperature and awareness, anything. And uh, for long term, it's uh, a different kind of uh, uh, way to show the work or to pre preserve the work uh, from a traditional Chinese art. So that's what's about the material I use. And uh, basically on this painting, I just using regular shrimp paper and ink. And uh, the ink is one of the blackness I use. It's not only Chinese ink, but also using different kind of a blackness, you know, water medium paints including the gouache, uh, black uh, powder, and also watercolor, Chinese paints, and Chinese ink, all black color, whatever is a uh, water mixable, I use it. So that's why you can see the variety, different kind of a blackness and the all kind of changes and during the blackness, uh, this kind of color. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's for the, for the paint itself. Uh, and also then uh, it's, it would be great interesting to work with uh, scientists, you know, return back to the scientists and maybe you were asking why I work with a scientist because I'm our artist. And uh, I have a pretty uh, interesting life, you know, back to my um, teenage and, uh, and I, I love art. You know, I started my art during the Cultural Revolution which is uh, 1966 to 1976. And I painted many, many propaganda pictures on the public. And, uh, you know, those pub, uh, propaganda pictures are huge. Unfortunately, I don't have so many photos left because at that time I was a poor, I didn't have a camera. And uh, like this type of uh, 
propaganda, big, big propaganda pictures that uh, I paint on the public square, public square. And, I can make uh, that move too. Yeah. So, Just kidding. Yeah, that's, that's, that's those, those pictures, you know, this is only the uh, few picture I left, you know, those uh, copy I left and I, I painted, I don't know how many pictures I painted for the public. Those public pictures more than I can say the very big, you know, it's probably the biggest picture I painted ever in my life. It's just uh, at least like a 50 feet high, 50 feet high, you know, for, you know those are square, the public square in the city can host for a million people to be gathering. So uh, when I was a teenager, I already started that one. But one day was very curiously, one person to come in and see, hey, do you want to work in our department? I say, what are you working department? He said, well, I'm in working for it and uh, a city, you know, scientific, science department, which is called uh, a provincial scientific uh, uh, bureau. So, and you, you can come to work as an art illustrator working for artists, uh, for scientists. Then I said, sure, at that time, I didn't have a job. Then I said, okay, so I started working with the, the, comp, the, 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 the department and uh, working with uh, lots of scientists around me. I'm a, I was only the artist, the art illustrator and also helped the scientist to, to illustrate or to draw their picture, you know, so, and, uh, you know, according to the scientific success. So I learned a lot. So I learned a lot from the scientists. I was uh, very inspired about their knowledge. You know, still right now, you know, all those doctors give me some secret, uh, you know, method and you know, how to cure some of the disease or some of the uh, scientists tell me how to work with uh, other things. And also I remember I also draw a lot of picture for uh, uh, illustration for the local newspaper regarding like a future word and you know, all kinds of things. And uh, at that time, 40 years ago, all those, uh, uh, the future word illustration have become real right now. It's just like right now we're doing the video communication. At that time we called a, a video telephone, you know, in my illustration, but it all become real. Since I came to US, you know, 30 years ago and I'm living in the Silicon Valley area, you know, the Bay Area. So I, I, I know a lot of scientists and I can say I know more scientists here than artists. So I was very lucky to know Han Song, and he's a very smart, you know, scientist. Also, he's very artistic. It's very important to work with someone is artistic too. So we exchanged our, you know, experience, and he, you know, I was so inspired about his, uh, you know, his, his, his uh, smart idea to how to become, make the painting become visualized as another way. So when I first visit him, and I say. He showed me one of the glass, you know, the visual glass, you know, so he said, hey, you wear the glass, you can see the 360, uh, 360 degree of a uh, visual art in front of you. And I was uh, fascinated for that. I said, well, can you make the painting move? Okay, so he said, well, I can try. So anyway, so I thought that he probably would try forever, but actually he just did about eight months, you know, so invented a, in this uh, very fascinating interactive work. And uh, so I, in my life, I'm, I love to work with artists, uh, with, uh, with scientists. And I was very beneficial from, from uh, scientific technology as well. So I'm going to further working on this one with artists, uh, with scientists as well. And this is, uh, it, it's just not, um, uh, it's become a lively, you know, interesting. Okay, thank you, Alan. Some common themes that I heard were about the ways in which you collaborate as scientists and artists and something common that I think that you both share is as a person who who thinks about, about materials is from the painting side, you're really considering the surface and the marks on the surface and your expression and your grappling with it and then how to extend the material life of the surface when you mount it on the harder canvas, right, as you just explained me. And then when um, Han Song was referring to kind of his sort of uh, virtual based image making art, you're talking about making paintings move. And that itself is a sort of, where is the surface in that? Um, I, you know, I'm kind of curious a little bit about do you as a creator, you know, across media in your work as both collaborative artists and scientists. Do you think about that? And what is it 
in that, you know, because as an artist, I always work alone for myself, I enjoy my artwork and just like my work. And also I read it later on, I say, well, how can we other people to enjoy my work? Or can, how can they participate in my work? And not just like I enjoy it by myself, I want everyone participating in my work and recreating my work. So that is the dream actually, it used to be my dream and see how can make the painting moved and everyone can play with that. Everyone can uh, enjoy in, in, in the work and also recreate the work as they want. So I, that is why I told this idea to Han Song and see whether it's become possible or not. And I was luckily Han Song said, well, it's definitely possible. So right now the work is not just, uh, you know, artists, artists just like uh, provide uh, initial painting and uh, the participant, all the visitor can, can join in and like a dance with the ink look like. So it's become uh, 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 all the public participation at this time. Han Song, yeah. Ah, uh, right. So uh, as uh, Ming was talking, I was uh, uh, thinking about uh, um, uh, whether, uh, at what level of abstraction am I going to answer uh, Alan's uh, question? Because uh, her question has to do with uh, what exactly uh, is uh, this painting uh, in a computer, right? So. Um, so I think uh, at a moderate level of abstraction, uh, we could uh, think about uh, uh, a river, okay? So what is a river in a computer, right? So if you think about it, well, um, in a river at every point uh, in the water, uh, because the water is flowing, right? It probably has uh, a velocity. It has a speed, right? And at that point, uh, probably some um, uh, water molecules is a circling around that point. So there's a vorticity. And also because of the uh, elevation changes, uh, there is a force, um, likely a component of gravity that's pushing the water, right? So at every point in that river, you have, uh, you have uh, these uh, quantities, right? And uh, suppose, if you can collect these quantities at every point in the river, I mean like every point, like very dense grid of sampling points, okay? Then you arrive at the digital version of the river, <laughs> okay? So the good thing about uh, this uh, exercise is that once uh, you arrive at the digital version of the river, you can do a lot of things about it, right? You can add uh, extra force, Right, you can uh, inject ink at any point without affecting any other point, and there's a lot you can do. And once you do that, and the laws of physics uh, would uh, tell you how it's going to evolve, uh, uh, evolve. Right. So coming back to this painting, this is uh, essentially uh, in a computer is a grid uh, of such points. Uh, they are very dense ones. Uh, it's a very dense grid, and at every point there are uh, these quantities of uh, speed, pressure, uh, density, vorticity, uh, all these uh, elements. And uh, in the end, uh, you do the computation and see how they evolve and uh, visualize uh, some of these uh, quantities in actual visual forms. And in this case, in terms of the displacement of the original painting. Right, so this is uh, what the painting is uh, in the computer. And also uh, the grid is more abstract than the painting in the sense that you can swap in another painting, right? And it will work exactly the same. I mean, uh, I can swap in uh, say uh, a Rembrandt uh, for that matter, but it wouldn't work so well that goes back to uh, what I said in the beginning, which is the uh, match, uh, the organicness uh, of the match between uh, Ming's painting and this form of motion uh, is surprisingly good, right? So uh, that's where the synergy uh, is. I don't know if uh, that answers uh, your question, Alan, but uh, that's a shot. Yeah, 
Yeah, I have a little additional um, explanation for why I put on the title for this work as a mysterious ink world. And also, you know, in the in the painting, Chinese painting, in the ink painting, we also consider the the black area is also important, same importance to the black area. And uh, with black area, we consider in, in Chinese we call liu bai, and also is considered as the, the white area is is air, is water, is the sky, is the universe. So we consider white area and the black area is very meaningful. So the black area is a movement. So how can you work with the black and white? It's also considered about the, the movement on the, on the nation, on the universe. So that is why they, they brings you so much changes when you're working with the ink work. And when you think about this black and white and how they move around it, how the uh, blackness uh, and also this uh, and also blank area, how they move around it and it brings you uh, all kind of imagination about the world. What is the world will be look like, especially what is the ink world will be look like. It's mysterious, you know, so you can discover a lot. Okay, you can discover a lot of uh, uh, something, you know, out of expectation and after you participate in. That is why when the people goes in this interactive work, then can just like they're wandering around, uh, where are we? Uh, I, I'm in a in, uh, very mysterious world. It's like a very strange. And also from their body movement, they also can change the world. So this is another meaning for the work I put on the mysterious ink world. And that's the world I'm trying to get more and more discovery. Thank you. Yeah, good. Okay, so this is the work we are, Han Song and I will work for the next next show. Let me go back to this very short video. And uh, people can, this is in my studio. So we're working on the uh, next work and also people can walk in and also step in the painting and also make the painting move. And uh, then the whole exhibit wall will full of the painting on the ground. Then the, the audience can play with the picture or dance with the picture and make this uh, another kind of uh, interactive work. That's the, that's the work we're going to do. And yeah. uh, and we're going to show, and hopefully, in the future, in the in the to the public, and we do have a couple more other idea. We'll uh, develop this uh, interactive work and uh, make it much more interesting that people can participate in. Thank you. That that is 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 great. Could you also maybe show the one in the very large scale version of Mysterious Ink World? Sure. Open it up and then show that window. Okay. That's just a hint of what the Ackland experience is like. Although of course the the answer really is go to the Ackland, which which is open to the public nowadays. Check us out Ackland.org. In the, the first show in Sandong Art Museum, and uh, this is a much larger, like a three times bigger than the, than the one is showing at the Eklund Museum. That's, uh, that's my hometown, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that's your hometown. So we are very <laughs> excited. So, so we- My had, mom got to see it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it's uh, very, you know, we show in the different places like, uh, you know, in China and also in New York and also it was great. This is a good first time show at the Econ Art Museum. We we're very excited to have this piece of work and to show at the Han Song's uh, 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 mother school here. <laughs> and also he's a wonderful alumni for your school. And I think it would be very interesting to and you see, you know, people to see how you're successful uh, education, you know, bring it over to, uh, you know. So anyway, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, we, we have more to go. So we are working uh, hard in the studio and uh, hopefully we, we have a more chance to display our work to the public. One of the things Han Song and Ming that's different at the Ackland, and this is one of the questions that has, has come up, is that it's being shown as part of an exhibition of Asian art, historical Asian art. And a question came up from the audience, to what extent do you see this in a tradition of Asian art? Is it in some way connected to even other trends in contemporary Asian art? Or is it less connected to those contexts?
Um, well, uh, my first reaction would be that, uh, uh, in my view, uh, this is uh, more uh, related to uh, natural phenomena than uh, particular uh, genres uh, of art, uh, because uh, the engine that drives this uh, is is a natural phenomenon. You know that this particular fluid phenomenon is absolutely universal, and um, you know the so I can imagine. Uh, other genres of art, whether Asian or not, being driven by uh, like either this or other uh, types of uh, natural uh, phenomena that can be simulated and exist in uh, creative forms uh, in the in the digital world. Uh, I think I think uh, you know so you know from the history you will see the science and also developed and also follow up with uh, art, with different uh, from a uh, Renaissance to the Impressionism, to the postmodernism to now the digital art. So artists need to follow up the time to follow up the technology and the science, you know, the time change. We cannot go back to a hundred years ago. So nowadays, I believe if a scientist, you know, if an artist can work together with a scientist, we can created something very spectacular, you know, so it differences from before. And also we can create some new art and uh, which is, so uh, will be, uh, we developed art history at this time. And it's it's very important for, for artists also know a little bit about our science, you know, so because if you don't know anything about science and also you will stay with your own, it will be very hard to move forward. That's my point of view. Good question. Um, oh, I see a few more questions in the chat room, but one maybe that's kind of interesting, you know, to hear from Han Song and then Ming um, is, do the interactive portions ever repeat? Um, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It never repeats. Um, so this is a true simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's different from a simulation um, that you would use to support uh, the design of a boat or an airplane uh, only in the sense of precision. I'm definitely not achieving the precision here that's required to um, like design a boat and put it in the water. But, as, but except for that, uh, the simulation is the same. Uh, the, uh, the laws of uh, physics applied uh, are uh, the same. So it uh, it just uh, it never repeats. This is uh, one of the category of things that uh, that is um, deterministic, but is not uh, predictable. Mm -hmm. So there's no formula here. It's just uh, uh, the simulation of the fluid uh, according to the Navier-Stokes equations. Ming, do your paintings? Yeah, I think I think so too. I agree with Han Song, and also as an artist part, you know. So even if you want to repeat or uh, imitate the same picture, you can never make exactly the same. We're talking about, of course, you know, you make changes. So as um, as a visitor, of course, they play in, and I I watch so many times about the, whether I can find a second that will be exactly the same as what I'm from memory. I couldn't find it. So it's uh, because everyone is different. You know, you come in, you bring the different energy in, and I'll make the different uh, changes for the image itself. So I don't think it will be repeated exactly the same at any chance. Do we try to make a distinction between Chinese and Western art, but not Chinese and Western science? Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. So, uh, so the answer to that is that uh, um, in terms of uh, science, there is an external master. Uh, which is nature, right? So uh, you do something wrong, uh, planes would fall from the sky and the rockets would explode. So you can you can debate all you want, okay? But uh, in the end, the final judge is uh, is nature. So when science makes contact with nature, whether in terms of uh, making some stuff or uh, in terms of uh, uh, observations that people can agree on, uh, there is that uh, ultimate judge, uh, which is nature. 
looks like that's a that's really thought provoking. Uh, the second question in that same um, uh, uh, audience member is submitting: Does your collaboration represent a new voice for transcultural identity? That's very um, very positive outlook. <laughs> in other words. Well, um, in, in the in a sense, it is a time series because uh, your current state, uh, you know, the it's uh, the steps are in time. So uh, um, we would understand that motion as the change of positions in time, right? Okay. So your next position is based on the current position, right? So uh, so in that sense, it is a time series. So the positions uh, of uh, this uh, individual uh, dots, uh, if you will, uh, individual pixels uh, on the painting, uh, where they are, uh, their current location is depend dependent on their previous location. And their next location is dependent on the current location. So I think uh, uh, the it is a series in time. Well, uh, back to the question to Michael Grady uh, on the on the chart. He said, "Why do we make a distinction between Chinese and Western art, but not Chinese and Western science? Does your collaboration represent our new voice of uh, transcultural uh, transcultural identity?" Well, that's good questions. Okay, you know the science we cannot divide it at the East and the West because the scientists. You know, the technology can be utilized by the whole mankind right away. But uh, the art is a culture. It's very sometimes local. So China has this long-term history of a culture, like a painting, ink painting. Western has it, it's an oil painting. So, uh, 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 yeah. so they have a different kind of uh, culture history background regarding that. So right. somehow so we, 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 you know, traditionally we divide it as an, you know, different type of art. But right now, the art become more and more globalized. So we don't think the ink work uh, usually belongs to the Chinese. The ink mm. work is now become more and more international. So I think uh, in the future, or this from now on to the future, all those uh, local art once it become more globalized and the, then this, this kind of distinction would get less and less. I hope that is the answer. And I think uh, all those cultural exchange, like uh, Eastern Western art exchange, uh, culture exchange, and brings those distance uh, getting narrower and narrower, eventually will merge together. There was no more, no more distinction between Eastern and Western, whatever art, and of course, no si uh, science at all. So science, of so, course, definitely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say that uh, science, if you look at it, um, is uh, fundamentally, a mechanism of building uh, consensus. And in this case, a consensus on nature. So there are things like, oh, if you do things in your uh, laboratory, you get this result, I must be able to do it in my lab and get the same result. And uh, if that's not the case, then the result is in dispute until you know, most of the people can repeat uh, your experiments. So it's a fundamentally a mechanism to build a consensus. Now in cultural matters, uh, there are also uh, mechanisms of uh, building consensus. So for example, there's, uh, there are uh, a lot of studies about myth, right? As a mechanism of uh, building uh, consensus uh, and create cultural cohesion. So that is uh, uh, another mechanism of building consensus on, uh, on cultural and uh, different matters. So I guess, uh, you know, the, the question is uh, whether uh, you can have the uh, science model of building consensus applied to other areas. Uh, so that I'm not sure about. I think uh, uh, that's a pretty hot area uh, of research in uh, social sciences. So I think with that, uh, we have uh, coming, coming towards the close. Um, I will answer one last question that was in the in the Q and A as a way of encouraging people to come to the Ackland to see the piece. The question was, if the projection is still, 
until people enter or is it always moving? And I think I can answer for you that it, it responds to your presence. So yes. it's still until a human being comes in and then it's actually in a very graceful way, an interesting word that you are using on song, it starts to move. And that yes. gracefulness is a key part of the aesthetic effect, both of Ming's painting and yes. of the projection in an extraordinary way. So yeah. it, it, it falls to me to thank you both artists and Ellen curator for having introduced us to this work um, and for all of our audience and, and questioners um, who have made this such an interesting um, hour. Ellen, do you have anything you want to say at the end or? Um, well, you're muted, so you. <laughs> Uh, one quote that I'm still ruminating after hearing all of these really fascinating um, sort of points about computer generated images and non repeating elements and the presence of movement and flow is this uh, famous text about painting and it was there's now it's referred to as the six laws. And the first law is about how um, this concept of chi which you might think about as active matter um, is, is born and it engenders movement. And no one really quite knows how to apply that, but I wonder if we don't try to answer the question of what do we do with this, but continue to see this as an active project today and in the future, either through the type of art that Han Song is working on or what Ming is working on. I think that maybe the question continues to be explored and grappled with in the future in a sort of exciting manner through both ends of science and art um, in this sort of constant questioning and reflecting that I find is most exciting about this work. Um, that's it, but thank you everyone. And thank you, Peter and Allison and the team at Ackland for this great hour of thinking and discussion. <laughs>